Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, the topic on cases in portfolio management and risk management, and the learning module on case study in portfolio management, institutional investor. It's always fun when you're at the end of a topic, and by the way, we're at the end of level three here, in case you didn't notice, uh, to look at some cases to emphasize pretty much everything that we've done since the beginning of level one. But in particular, and way more specifically, what we're going to do is apply what we learned in those first four learning modules inside of this topic area. The Institute is very clear in the first paragraph or two that we're going to emphasize liquidity, we're going to emphasize asset allocation, and we're going to emphasize the use of derivative securities to modify that asset allocation. We'll call that tactical asset allocation. So look at those first two LOSs. There we go. Liquidity and illiquidity. We'll talk about that. Uh, skip down to the bottom second one down there, derivative overlays. And somewhere in there, we're going to use uh, derivatives to modify asset class and risk exposures. Uh, we'll have a brief conversation about manager selection and a handful of slides on ESG considerations at the end of this slide deck. Let's do just a quick review. Strategic asset allocation, of course, you know that that means long-term investment strategy. So when the institu institutional client comes to you and says, here, have $100 million, you figure out what to do with it. So what you're doing then is taking those long-term risk and return objectives into consideration and establishing this asset allocation strategy. Now, that doesn't mean that periodically you're not going to adjust those strategic asset allocations. And in fact, you may tactically change them depending on the dynamics of the market and the changes within inside, inside of that institutional investor. So you know those factors, uh, risk tolerance, return objective, horizon, financial goals. Uh, two things here that the strategic asset allocation can work towards. It can support spending policies and it can determine the asset allocation not only to traditional classes of fixed income and equity securities, but also to all of those conversations that we had on um, alternative investments. Uh, we bolded in red the three uh, super important issues that the, um, that the Institute emphasizes in this first section. So let's go ahead and start talking about liquidity risk. We learned this back in level one. Remember, we did that uh, the building blocks model where we're trying to come up with a required return on a financial security. And one of those building blocks was a liquidity premium. And so, of course, then this translates into the policy statement for an institutional investor that says something like, we have two issues of liquidity. We've got one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Take a pension fund, for example. What is the pension fund's goal? Is to make certain that all of those retired workers have a monthly income. So there are going to be liquidity cash outflows. The question then becomes on the other side is what what kind of securities are we going to be able to invest in to deliver those monthly uh, cash flows? Now, what the Institute emphasizes here in, in this section is not only those two issues of liquidity that I just described, but also having to be forced to deal with liquidating portions of the portfolio and then having to sell at a super discount. So that's why this distressed sale of illiquid assets then comes into play. And of course, of course, the offset of that is this illiquidity premium associated with, you know, lots and lots of these alternative investments. So look down at the bottom. There are some tools. So we'll just go ahead and look at a time to cash table here in just a second. We'll talk about rebalancing and commitment strategies, especially those commitment strategies as they relate to particular uh, alternative investments, you know, like private equity or maybe even a hedge fund. Then we're going to stress test. We did stress testing clearly back in level two and even a little bit of a conversation in level one. And then uh, and then this derivative overlay strategy. I always use the terminology in, in my in my classes. I say, right, think about you, you own an asset 
or you want to own an asset. And then what you can do is you can lay a derivative on top or you can lay it underneath or the sides, however you want to look at it. So the Institute calls, calls that an overlay strategy. I always tell my students, just think of it as a, as a two asset portfolio. You have the underlying spot asset and then you have the derivative security. So that's kind of like a two asset portfolio. So the Institute calls that an overlay strategy. All right, this concept of liquidity profiling is very interesting, and the Institute does a really good job of putting together a table here. Let me show you this table. So we're going to look at this table here in just a second, but what that does is that it helps the analysts to establish liquidity needs and the maturity profiles. This is what I was saying here during the introduction. you got liquidity on both sides of the balance sheet, and essentially this is just a schedule. So the Institute then says, let's go ahead and say something like, all right, how much uh, are we going to compare our particular security or our particular needs to the calendar? So uh, less than a week, less than a quarter, less than a year, greater than a year. Remember those liquidity classifications, highly liquid all the way down to illiquid. And then that liquidity budget over on the other, uh, on the right hand column there, that relates to the entire asset allocation to a particular class. Now, the Institute gives you a really, really nice table. Uh, it's a super long table, one that we couldn't squish into, uh, into a slide, but I want you to go to that table and then I want you to go after this uh, slide deck is over to the questions at the end of the learning module. There are 12 of them in there and there's one question here that I'm gonna give you the answer to right away. And this is probably a very likely question on the exam as it relates to this table and this uh, liquidity management table that's inside of the learning module. The question is, look at some of these allocations and compare the risk and the return objective. And the answers, as you'll see to this particular question, it's only one question, by the way, is very, very simple. And so there's, a, there's an asset class, I think it's private equity. And the range of allocation is, I think it's 20 to 25%. And it has this huge standard deviation. And so you're thinking, how can you maintain this illiquid asset with, those, with that narrow range with such a high standard deviation? So that's the one that's going to need to be uh, rebalanced. The other one is cash. Cash, of course, has a low standard deviation. And the asset allocation, the strategic allocation is like, I can't remember exactly, like five to 20%. And so clearly that's, uh, that's out of line. So I think it's important two things here to remember those classifications according to the calendar on the left hand side, and then relate those classifications to the strategic asset allocation range and compare that to the standard deviation. And that's what that bottom up basis for each investment, that's what that means here. Now, we're going to rebalance uh, with a systematic policy or an automatic adjustment policy. We did this back in, in level two. Uh, notice under that systematic rebalancing policy, we have these tolerance bands. This is what I was talking about, a range just, uh, just a second ago. And we're going to re rebalance according to some kind of a system. Maybe it's a percent range, maybe it's calendar rebalancing, maybe it's just some kind of a tie-in with um, one of those great factor models that we described back in level two. And we talked about them in level three as well, in which we do this factor analysis. And if this one factor gets out of, uh, out of place, out of that particular predetermined range, then we have to, uh, then we have to rebalance. That automatic adjustment mechanism is exactly what the name suggests. We just have some kind of a stable risk profile and it automatically does it for us. Now these commitment strategies, th these are interesting. I think these are two really, really good exam questions here. Look on the, uh, look on the right hand side. So we have some of these alternative investments in which we're, which we're uh, committed to some kind of a drawdown or a distribution, or you know maybe the asset grows to like this big, or maybe it grows to like this big. So we're going to use scenario analysis to cash flow that modeling. So we take a look at all these alternatives, and you can throw equity and fixed income in there as well. And so you have this cash flow modeling. You just predict what those cash flows are going to be, whether they're inflows or outflows, and then you determine what those changes to the asset allocation 
and ought to be. On the other hand, this multi-year funding strategy is kind of a global picture. It's kind of like an idea where you say, you know what, I think we should have uh, an investment to real estate between five and 8%. And I think that should go on for the rest of our lives, or at least to the end of that investment time period, or till the end of time, you know, whichever of those comes first. What that does then, that multi-year funding strategy, is that that is um, the two, the one of the two models that is super consistent with the risk and return objectives that we've emphasized since the very beginning of, uh, of level one. Stress testing, I'm hoping you guys remember all of our conversations about stress testing. I, I always think of it in terms of an Excel spreadsheet and you go into that Excel spreadsheet and at the bottom you have some estimate. And in this case, it's some kind of a liquidity need. And let me go back here real quickly. Maybe you can do this stress test for the highly liquid, the liquid, the semi-liquid and the illiquid securities that you have. Maybe you can do a stress test for each one of those and you have this stress test. So down at the bottom, your output is, you know, some measure of cash flow. And then you go up and you pick a cell and suppose that cell has a hundred in it and you change it to a thousand or you change it to 5,000 or some extreme market condition mm -hmm. that could be the result of COVID or the stock market uh, uh, crisis back in 2008. So these extreme market conditions. So you go ahead and you perform this and at the bottom of your Excel spreadsheet, you have a number and then you go change it again. And so look down at the bottom, you can use historical data, you can use any of those statistical models that we emphasized back in level two, or you can do sensitivity analysis or scenario analysis to uh, come up with all sorts of fun things. And then if, if you're if at the, your output at the bottom of the Excel spreadsheet is some measure of liquidity, look in the look in the middle there, boy, you can compute like average liquidity. You can compute correlations of highly liquid and illiquid. You can compute standard deviations. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with this stress testing. But I think the good question here is kind of a global question, a big picture question in which all you're really doing is going back and uh, changing the inputs into the model, whatever model that is, so that you get a different output that is reflective of an extreme market condition. And what we're going to do is use uh, derivative securities. We've got option contracts, we have futures contracts, we have swap contracts, we have ex exchange traded funds, we have all sorts of fun things out there. And the advantage of using a derivative, of course, is leverage. So what do we do? We use leverage. You know, if you buy a share stock, yeah, let's suppose you have to buy, pay $100, but you could buy an option, a call option on that share of stock for two or five or $10. So there's leverage, right? You have a position in this hugely uh, valuable asset and you only have to pay a fraction of it. So what that means then is that with that much less original investment, not only are you taking advantage of leverage and you're hoping to get the, uh, the benefits of leverage, but you can capture that illiquidity premium inside of all of your other financial securities out there. Now, a couple of ways that we can uh, view this illiquidity premium. And by the way, the Institute uh, uh, has in parentheses somewhere in the middle of, uh, of this first section is that the illiquidity premium. And then it says sometimes called a liquidity premium. So I'm not quite sure why the Institute picks that extra two letters to put at the, be the beginning. You know, I'm thinking that when you learn that building blocks model back in level one, you're thinking of a liquidity premium as kind of like an opportunity cost. But the Institute, I'm guessing, uses the terminology illiquidity premium to go ahead and capture like the extra, extra uh, premium for opportunity cost because we're in an asset class that is characterized by a lack of liquidity. So I, and the Institute uses those two terms interchangeably, so I guess uh, I guess you can do the same thing. So that first part there, capturing the illiquidity premium, goes back to exactly what we talked about in the building blocks model. But we can also view this illiquidity premium as a put option. And you have to understand this concept of a marketable price. Think of a marketable price as the price that an illiquid asset would sell for if it had a highly liquid market. You know, it's kind of like this, uh, uh, this theoretical price. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's suppose we have this asset and it's illiquid and we pay $95 for it. 
but the marketable price, if it traded regularly, would be 100. All right, so that strike price, the exercise price of the put option is 100. We paid $95 for that, so that's the, that's the price of it, right? So what we're saying is the difference between those two, the intrinsic value, that's the value of that option at the expiration of the option. We don't really know when the expiration date of that option is. So in our example, we're gonna capture that $5, right? We sell it for, I'm sorry, we buy it for 95, and then we could hypothetically sell it for a hundred right we have the right but not the obligation to sell at the strike price of that marketable price of a hundred dollars and so if you view that illiquidity premium as a put option what do we know we know about options we know from that black shoals Merton option pricing model that there are five super important variables right you have the underlying spot price you have the exercise price time to maturity some kind of an interest rate maybe it's a risk-free rate of interest maybe here with real estate or alternative investments. Maybe it's not the risk-free rate of interest, but let's live with that. And then, oh, which one did I forget? Oh, the volatility in the underlying asset. So we're trying to capture pricing information, this illiquidity premium, so that we have a better understanding of not only the present value of this security, but also its future value. Mm -hmm. Now, here's just a little summary of what we can do. So the intrinsic value of the option, strike price minus current market price. So here we go. The value of the put option is that marketable price. That was $100, right? And the actual sale price was the, uh, the 95 that I was saying earlier. So there's the intrinsic value. So I think there's a good question about just a viewing an illiquid uh, asset as a put option, and I would be able to explain it. Actually, let me go back here. If you can do that right green box there, marketable price minus the actual sale price, I think you can get that uh, correct on the exam. Now, even viewing uh, the illiquidity premium as a put option, there's still some problems here. You know, so what are some other risk factors? Market value, size in the equity investments, uh, what did we say earlier? Just volatility. The question then becomes, does that volatility capture the illiquidity? So there are tons of pricing challenges in there. Lots of times we'll say something like, let's suppose that asset that we bought for 95 was an apartment building. What we'll try to do is we'll try to say something like, oh, you know, here's an apartment building next door. There's one up the street. There's one across town. You know, let's go ahead and see if we can look at some kind of individual transactions and then put them together into a uh, into some kind of an index. Does that index capture all of those variables that are important? Uh, potential differences in individual investment experience. All right, so there's a, there's a little bit of a behavioral finance issue in there. Liquidity budgeting, that's important as well. All right, so that first section there in this learning module was an emphasis on liquidity and asset allocation. So now we're going to go ahead and work through a case. So this is one of our cases. This is modeled after the case in the learning module. So what I would love for you to do is work through this with us now, and then go back to the learning module and work through that one. Now, they have huge amounts of data in there. We've tried to uh, uh, restrict it in the interest of time and space, um, but what I want you to do is compare what we've done, compare what they've done, and that should prepare you fully for any kind of a case question that you get uh, on the exam. All right, so here we go. Nexus University Endowment. We've got 10 billion, 70% unrestricted. Operating budget of $600 million, 55% of it funded by the endowment. So there's the Yale formula. Uh, I wonder if the Institute is going to require you to know that Yale formula. Just take 5% of the uh, beginning value, uh, the beginning of the year. Maybe it's the fiscal year. Maybe it's the calendar year, and that's going to be the uh, that's going to be the spending policy. Now, this Yale formula may have some kind of an adjustment for geometric returns rather than uh, rather than uh, regular old average returns. Maybe just remember five percent of initial value makes perfect sense. Uh, 
uh, 5% long-term spending rate, minimize market fluctuations, yeah, endowment targets, 7 to 9% nominal return per year with a 13 to 15% annual standard deviation. All right, so those two things uh, are the risk and return objective. That, make, that makes perfect sense. We need to make certain that we uh, consider those risk and return objectives when we're doing all the other stuff inside of the policy statement. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have an investment company called uh, NextGen that's managing the endowment. So we've got fixed income, public equity, private equity, real estate, I'm sorry, real assets, and diversifying strategies. So think of those diversifying strategies as almost anything that doesn't sound like share of stock and a bond, diversifying strategies. Um, I think the emphasis in the uh, in the learning module is on is on hedge funds and private equity, but it could be almost anything. We have a senior portfolio manager and an analyst. So what is that? One, two, three, four, five classes up there. So two. So that's uh, that's what's five times two. So that's ten people involved at least initially that we have to worry about. All right, how about the strategy favors long term investments? Well, that sounds like a good uh, boy. If you get to the question on the in, on the exam and the institute says uh, they favor short term investment strategy, then uh, oh my gosh, I don't, I wouldn't even know what to do with that. Yeah, includes alternative investments. We said that. Um, yeah, allocation over thirty years, graduate gradual increase in emerging markets, private equity. All right, that makes sense. Uh, that goes back to that. Uh, here, let me swing back here. That goes back to not just the Yale formula, but the Yale strategy. Aren't these Ivy League schools known for being among the first to uh, invest in uh, real estate and private equity and uh, hedge funds, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so look at the bottom here. This is a key part of future. Increase allocation to alternative investments, reduce allocation to equities. So let's go back from uh, 1990 all the way to, let's say, the 2020s, the early 2020s. And so just take a look at the very left graph over there at the uh, on the left column. What do you have? You have lots of green. You have lots of what's that red and um, you have lots of purple. So what are those things that looks an awful lot like, you know, bonds and shares of stock. But as you go all the way over to our current state, what happens? Our investment in fixed income, our investment in domestic and our investment in international equities, those shrink and they're substituted by private equity and diversifying strategies. So that makes perfect sense. Notice the uh, asterisk down there, main, mainly hedge fund strategies under those diversifying strategies. So here's here's my thought, you know, when I have my students do the Harry Markowitz Efficient Frontier, the first thing that we do in the graph and using Solver is we, uh, we graph the equal weighted portfolio. Now these are just 10 or 15 uh, shares of stock. Most of them are, you know, uh, well-known corporations that I, I let my students pick. And we find that the equal weighted portfolio is inefficient. It never, it almost never shows up on Harry Markowitz's efficient frontier. And so my first thought is that, you know, you look at those there, they almost look like they're equal weighted. And so I always think to myself, that uh, I wonder how efficient that portfolio is over there. Uh, that's a conversation for uh, for a different uh, a different day. All right, how about the team and its responsibilities? So look for this on the exam, just in a brief, uh, you know, a brief table. Eleven individuals. Um, you know, we had this conversation back in our corporate finance discussion where what is the optimal number of board members? You know, eight or nine or ten or eleven—that sounds like a good one. But if you if you see twenty-seven board members, you might say to yourself, "Boy, there are lots and lots of behavioral issues that can show up when there are so many of them." Likewise, if there are only three, right? So you got to worry about having too few or too many. Eleven, eight or ten or twelve—that that sounds like it's okay. All right, the board approves investment policies, final approval. All right, so this is just kind of standard stuff here. Responsibility for implementing the policy. All right, we're going to hire some external managers. That's okay, but the internal staff manages asset allocation, risk management, and manager selection. Uh, so we're, we have a portfolio strategist. So we're going to do these overlays, which we'll do with the derivatives here at the end of this learning uh, learning 
uh, module. There's our tactical asset allocation. So remember that's short-term deviations from the strategic allocation. All right, so we have Eric Summers. Uh, he's an NU graduate, president, uh, and CIO at NextGen. He leads the investment committee. Team includes Sarah Robins, uh, Robinson, um, fixed income, public equities, and a portfolio strategist. All right, so um, current scenario. This is probably important here. Um, guides his team to address the following issues. So optimal liquidity, strategic asset allocation, tactical asset allocation, and then evaluate the underperformance over the last 10 years. So let me go back here. What has happened over the last 10 years? You know, are we going to go back to 2010 or 2015? The Institute, of course, would be very specific. You know, so there's the allocation, you know, eight or 10 or 12 years ago, whatever the, however you want to define a decade. So there over this changing from, you know, higher greens and reds down to lower greens and reds. All right, so let me just remind you, what did the Institute tell us at the very beginning? What's the emphasis on liquidity and then asset allocation? So you have the red, you have the green and the blue box. And then, of course, the orange over there on the right. This is pretty much a standard kind of a question. Evaluate, right? The Institute loves when we evaluate and monitor and review and edit and all those kinds of things. All right, how about a strategic asset allocation model? Yeah, Robinson and her team updated long-term capital market expectations and assumptions. All right, so what has happened? You know, maybe we had COVID, maybe we had a financial crisis, maybe we had all those. Maybe we're heading into a more normal economic growth period. We don't foresee any of these uh, kind of huge events on the near-term horizon, or maybe just the opposite. You know, so whatever updated long-term capital market expectations means. Ah, they use unsmoothing techniques on illiquid investments. This is really cool. You know, we, we, we talk about smoothing uh, for lots of times back in level two, but now we need to unsmooth. And so let me tell you about uh, what happens here. So let's suppose we have an apartment building like I suggested earlier, and that apartment building has not sold for 20 years. But every year we go and we uh, bring in a professional and we say, we want you to go ahead and uh, appraise the value. Maybe they use cash flows, maybe they use multiples, you know, whatever it is. You know, so every year you have an estimate of the value of that apartment building. And so what do you suspect happens over time? Over time, that probably increases, which means there's going to be some kind of a problem with the assumptions back in those statistical models that we loved in level two. There's probably going to be some kind of serial correlation. So look at the second bullet point there to eliminate that serial impact due to stale pricing. So if you have that serial correlation, which you're probably going to do when you don't have, you know, daily or weekly pricing, what that serial correlation is going to do is it is going to underestimate standard deviation and then overestimate all those other kinds of things that have standard deviation in the denominator, like, like a sharp ratio. All right. So we need all sorts of unsmoothing techniques. Now the Institute does talk about this and they give you a couple of different ways, but they don't tell you how we, uh, how we're going to unsmooth. So I wouldn't really worry about what those unsmoothing techniques are. But if you get to, uh, if, they, if the Institute says, oh, uh, this analyst used the Geltner model, well, you'll know that's, a, that's an unsmoothing technique. And so what this does then is it gives us a better idea about the volatility. So look at the very bottom after unsmoothing, the volatility for assets like private equity is significantly higher. So I think if you just remember, unsmoothing is a way to eliminate serial correlation. It's going to result in a more accurate standard deviation, which is very likely going to be higher. All right, let's take a look at a table here. We have all these asset classes down the, the left-hand column. We have real returns. So they, we take out inflation in there. What do we say at the bottom? 3%. And then we have that nominal return. Um, that's a geometric return. So that's important there. Uh, 
and then the standard deviation of returns and then a sharp ratio over on the right hand column so notice we have some red and we have some green bolded and these are just to emphasize you know maybe some deviations or maybe some things that are not expected look at domestic equity almost 22 percent standard deviation which is relatively close to the international developed equity usually that's uh there's a little bit of a higher uh, a, a larger difference uh, between those two. Um, notice that the international developed equity, almost 9% return, higher standard deviation than domestic equity, which is a little bit higher, 9%, which less standard deviation. So I think what the Institute is hoping that you do is extract that kind of risk and return information from the table. Now let's take a look at this underperformance uh, relative to the peers. Now, granted, you know, when we put together this slide deck, it's very difficult to do this kind of in a chronological order like the Institute can when they're giving it to you in a, in a document form. So some of the information here is not presented in a chronological form. So this is what happens down here at the bottom. So look at the blue boxes. There's our uh, current allocation, 2%, 17, 22, right? So you go across there and what are we gonna do based on Based on what we see back here in this table, we're going to go ahead and uh, and recommend some changes. So look at that second uh, arrow point. Robinson increases exposure, raising private equity, 19 to 24, real assets from 14 to 17, which means we're going to take from public equities, we're going to take from the fixed income allocations to reallocate that strategically to private equity and to real assets. So notice the fourth arrow point there. This is important. We're not going to do this right now. We don't want to tip the apple cart over and just completely change it. So we're going to do this gradually over the two to three year window. Now, what that means then is that the portfolio is going to have different characteristics so that uh, expected return goes from 6.8. Now, this is the entire portfolio, right? Uh, to 7.1. The real return goes up just a little bit. Standard deviation increases. Of course, it's going to increase, especially after we did all of that, uh, all of that unsmoothing stuff. Of course, that standard deviation and volatility is going to increase. And notice that the sharp ratio increased. So that's important, it, even though it's just a little bit. So that's important. Now look at the last purple box down there. Probability of 25% erosion in purchasing power over 30 years. Ah, so we're at 32%, so this is 28%. So it's important that you note that uh, the Institute is not gonna ask you to come up with those new allocations here. At least in this case assignment, they're gonna say here are the proposed ones and then here are the expected results. So that, that makes perfect sense. Now, of course, the consequence of changing that strategic asset allocation is that there is a probably dramatic shift in liquidity. So look at that third, uh, third bullet point up at the top. Potential liquidity issues in stress periods identified by Robinson's team include, because of this change in the asset allocation, is a couple of things down here. What about, uh, what about capital calls? Of course, we've got this increased allocation into the private market, so we need to worry about capital calls. We also need to worry about the activation of these gates because there are these certain investments, you know, maybe it's a hedge fund that says something like, you know what, if we have another COVID, you, you can't, you don't have access to your money, even if you're, even if you're, uh, even if you're entitled to having that access. So those are the gates, you know, the gates just kind of close. Uh, so you don't have access to that liquidity. So of course, this is, prop, this is a part of liquidity management. And then the smoothing effects, this is the difference between what we're saying now and that, uh, that de-smoothing or the unsmoothing that we talked about just, uh, just a few minutes ago. Now, in normal market conditions, what can we expect to happen? regular old cash flows, liquidity needs are managed, maybe we have some kind of shift in portfolio composition. And then as those allocations shift, we're gonna to need to adjust our strategy to handle all of the liquidity needs. All right, so what about these stressing under market conditions? So they can potentially trigger, trigger capital calls. 
We're, we've increased allocation to private markets, so our liquidity has decreased. And we may have, we have the potential for a decrease in cash inflows. And yeah, what about high stress market conditions? Yeah, increase in cash outflows and severe reduction in inflows. So this is a balance. You know, we talk, we always talk about even going back to level one, we talk about that matching principle here. We have a struggle to get this matching principle because we have such dramatic changes in, uh, in liquidity. So we may have to be uh, prepared. So this is one of those scenarios under which, you know, we make a decision and we say, all right, we got to worry about these liquidity issues. But then, but then, and the Institute is very big on this, we need to estimate, we need to predict what's going to happen in the future. So that if we have COVID part two, uh, sometime in the next five years that we're ready to manage it, if stock markets shut down, or fixed income markets shut down, or if apartment buildings shut down, All right, how about a market downturn here? All right, so we've got this smoothing. We talked about that, right? Spending rates above in a weak return environment. Yeah, I know this from my uh, my school. You know, the the uh, the college says something like, "Hey, you know what? We're going to go ahead and take uh, part of the earnings from the endowment, and we'll go ahead and throw that into the operating budget." But you know, maybe next year, if we have a super uh, poor economy, maybe we'll increase that to six percent or seven percent or some number. Yeah, of course, severe market downturns, you have uh, an exacerbation, that's a great word here, an increase in liquidity needs. So look at the bottom, need for careful evaluation and management by the team. Now let's go ahead and uh, consider this one LOS about how manager selection relates to all of the standards of professional conduct and the code. Um, this is a great way for the Institute to go ahead and say something like, all right, we're going to do something here in level three, but it relates all the way back to the very beginning of level one when we introduce that, that code of ethics. All right, so here we go. Look in the green box. We have a request for a private equity manager. Uh, Virginia Hart uh, is the owner of Pinnacle Venture. So she's going to say, hey, come invest in my firm, right? Uh, the university president and the treasurer support the uh, Pinnacle Venture Capital's proposal. All right, so this is interesting. You've got other people involved. I mean, these are important people, right? The university of president and let's say the CFO or the treasurer. Maybe that's the same individual. Maybe it's different individuals. But you have these two super important people in the college saying something like, hey, you know what? I think we should go with, uh, with Virginia. Now, what happens in this process, of course, is that if we are conducting our manager selection process according to the code, is that we're not going to just say, oh, OK, you guys want uh, PVC. We'll go ahead and do that. So we need to find someone else. So here we have PVC and Bayshore Venture Investment and merge as finalists. So here we're finding out some really, really cool things. And of course, the Institute is not going to give you a question on the exam in which they say something like, hey, all oh, this is awesome. You know, there are no violations. You know, don't worry about anything. So let's figure out what these violations are. Let's see. Jason Andrews, managing director and Summer's former colleague. Oh my gosh. All right. So Summer's former colleague, right? So here's the dude who's in charge of uh, uh, doing all of this stuff that we've been talking about over these last si slides. Confidential details of PVC's presentation and notes the inflated historical returns. I don't really know what that means. You know, didn't we learn back in level one that we need to make certain that we, you know, do all this performance presentation in this, this particular order and we need to, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. All right. Uh, Bayshore, despite being more established, has had performance issues in its previous fund. All right, so uh, we've got some problems here. What are we going to do? Recommend the preferred firm. Look down at the bottom here. Andrews reveals that Davidson's wife, Angela, is Hart's daughter. All right, so we've got some kind of internalism or nepotism, but this is clearly going to be a conflict of interest, even though, even though, look at the very next uh, diamond point, that it is common knowledge. So even if everybody knows it, that still doesn't mean that it's not, uh, that it's not a conflict of interest. All right, a couple of things up at the top here. PVC difficulty in raising 350 million. 
but it has strong management. PVC offers a low, lower its investment management fee. Ugh, I don't ever like that. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and see what kind of standards that we need to worry about here. So independence and objectivity. So Hart may have violated the standard if she exerted undue influence, right, to favor her company. There we go, conflict of in interest. There's uh, that word independence down there. Might be compromised. I'm just going to go ahead and say it's probably going to be compromised. But, you know, the Institute could could give you these questions on the exam in the multiple choice form, but they're probably not going to. This is probably going to be in the essay form. So, uh, boy, I think it's appropriate for you to get these terms down when you write. Don't say, like, I would be tempted to say, oh yeah, definite conflict of interest. So, you know, I think you can write the words, you know, make sure you write clearly, you know, this is a very likely conflict of interest, you know, and the independence is very likely to be compromised. Yeah, we misrepresented the performance history, so that, uh, that, that makes perfect sense here. Performance, presentation, historical standards. Yeah, utilizing non-public information, loyalty, best interests of Nexus, that makes sense. Diligence, yeah, you know, do, we have these, we, two firms emerge as the final uh, managers. What, what about a third, what about a fourth? I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you should have five or six. So reasonable basis and disclosure of those conflicts of interest. Of course, we need to disclose that. Um, we need to disclose it, and then we need to decide whether it's a whether it's a conflict of interest or not. Of course, maybe only time will tell. Maybe we say something like, "Okay, let's go ahead and hire this firm, and let's keep a close eye out on uh, on these individuals." But remember, when you're answering these questions, and you know, when uh, you know, it's been so long since I since I uh, took level three. And, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the statute of limitations has passed where I can at least mention that, you know, you know, you write and you write and me as a professor, I'm tempted to just continue writing. And I think the key in answering these questions even more accurately is to gather your thoughts before you write and, you know, kind of hit some bullet points. I just started writing and writing and I'm squishing my letters in and, uh, clearly that wasn't helpful. Um, all right, how about we've done we've done liquidity, we've done the asset allocation, and so the third emphasis here is on the derivatives. So let's go ahead. Notice we have we have lots of these uh, slides throughout uh, all of our recordings. Notice we're going to have derivatives, benefits, and costs, and then cash markets, uh, benefits, and costs. So this is a really really good uh, exam question or handful of exam questions. What do we like about derivatives? Well, I, I mentioned leverage earlier that lots and lots of derivatives are over the counter so that they can be customized or tailored to our specific risk and return objectives, which then links us back to each of the asset classes. Of course, derivatives, you know, if you're on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, you can show up at any time and you can, uh, you can close out your position. Maybe not at one o'clock in the morning, but pretty much uh, almost any time. Yeah, what don't we what don't we like about uh, derivatives? There's always this uh, third party or counterparty risk that always holds true because you have somebody else there who's taking both sides of the transaction, and you have to worry about that the uh, financial condition of that individual third party. Remember, futures contracts and other contracts have. Uh, uh, maintenance margins, they have daily margins, they have margin requirements, they have daily settlement, they have all sorts of stuff involved in there. And so ongoing monitoring and management. And then mispricing risk, um, you know, what do you have? You have this basis risk, you got the price of the spot, you got the price of the derivative. So there's that basis and you can track it, you know, we call that standard deviation or some kind of a tracking error. And you can say something like, oh my gosh, you know, the difference is this much. I think it ought to be this much. Now it's this much, you know, you got to worry about what that tracking error is. And so the Institute calls that mispricing the risk as you're layering this. What did we say earlier? An overlay or as you're layering the derivative on top of the spot. What do we like about cash? We talk at length about this back in our alternative investment conversations, you know, direct ownership, right? Simplicity, you know, you're owning it, so you don't have to worry about uh, daily settlement. And then there's no uh, there's no counterparty risk. Uh, 
What don't we like about it? Well, when you buy an apartment building, you got to buy the apartment building, right? Now, you could take out a loan, but it's still, uh, there's still leverage there involved. So significant amounts of capital, lots and lots of transaction costs. Not to mention just the difference between the bid price and the ask price, but also all of those adverse selection and adverse information costs. There's timing, there's cash drag, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so how do we use these derivatives to overlay our ownership in each of these classes? So let's go back to the next gen, our tactical asset allocation plan. We've got a tracking error limit of 150 to 300 basis points. Uh, this new tactical asset alloc allocation plan up to 200 basis points of the 300 basis points of the budget. And so we've the board has approved a maximum leverage position of 7%. That's probably an important part. All right, so what's our tactical asset allocation plan? What this does is allows us to overweight and underweight uh, changes over the short term. And so this allows us to change in the short term our asset allocations without, without moving to any kind of a change in that uh, long-term strategy. Now, I think that third uh, bullet point is really cool. So we, we figure out what is the fair value. We use some kind of a model and we come up with a fair value of our asset and we do trend analysis. Maybe we do time series stuff and we say something like, hey, what did we learn back in level two? We learned about this concept of mean reversion. So if we have uh, some kind of uh, an illiquid asset that is increasing in value and increasing value and it's outperforming its benchmark substantially. What do we know? We know and we suspect that it's going to revert to the mean. So we like owning this asset, but what we're going to do is layer maybe a futures contract on top of that. So we'll, we own the asset, so we'll short the futures contract. So when this asset, now remember, it could still be increasing in value, but as it, as it reverts to the mean, it's going to fall a little bit uh, relation to the benchmark, then that futures contract then captures the decline in value. We still own the asset, but we get the benefit of that tactical asset allocation when we suspect the asset is going to revert to the mean. And of course, we can do that on the upside as well. So you take the long or the short position in the derivative to capture those short term, uh, those short term uh, changes. Now, we can overweight U.S. equities. We can underweight U.S. equity. I mean, we can do whatever we want here. So if these large cap U.S. equities were priced significantly below their fair value, then mean reversion was predicted uh, over some time period. You know, the Institute says, uh, says 12 months. So how can we do this? Well, we can use a futures contract. We can use an exchange traded fund. We can use a total return swap. Remember all those fun conversations we had about swaps when, you know, essentially swaps were invented, uh, you know, at least on a grand scale to swap a fixed rate coupon payment for a floating rate coupon payment, you know, so this changed uh, the interest rate risk on a fixed income portfolio. But then when the financial engineers uh, on Wall Street figured out that you could swap almost anything, then the swap market then completely uh, completely took off. So you can have this total return swap. We could swap the returns on the U.S. equity, right? We want to receive the return on the U.S. equity, right? If they're below their fair value, then they're going to dramatically increase over the next 12 months. So we want to receive uh, that floating rate payment and we can send anything we want to the swap dealer. We could send a fixed payment. That would be probably the simplest uh, way to do this. Uh, or we could uh, we could send uh, some kind of a floating rate payment that is tied to some other kind of an index out there. I mean, there are just tons and tons of ways to do this. But remember, if we're going to overweight U.S. equities, we want to receive the equity index return. So let's address the question about which of these overlays do we want to use? ETFs, futures, or the swaps? So here's a table that outlines uh, the total costs, 39, 47, and 58. So you're tempted to say something like, hey, you know what, let's go ahead and use the ETFs. However, that's going to require a large amount of upfront cash. Get some of the other diamond points down at the bottom. 
100% of the value is needed or 50% on the permitted margin. Limited leverage opportunities for a hundred million investment with 50 million in cash and 50 million borrowed. So using futures and total return swaps to acquire a hundred million in exposure is uh, far less cash. I mean, extremely, I mean, it's super, uh, super less amount of cash. So outside of looking at uh, outside of looking at this table, we can see some of these numbers here. You know, what are the general advantages? And so the institute loves asking these kinds of questions. So futures and ETFs, way more liquid, low transaction, uh, early termination is possible, of course, flexibility, uh, negotiated terms of the return swaps. Remember the ETFs and the futures contracts; those are uh, standardized, especially the futures contracts. Now, remember all of our conversations back in level two, where we had uh, we had to compute the number of futures contracts. And remember, the number of futures contracts never came out to be the exact rounded number, you know, like 100. It always turned out to be, you know, 102.65. So you either uh, had to over or under hedge or over or under speculate. But remember what I taught you in one of those level two recordings is that, you know, to have a perfect hedge, you have to have the same underlying asset uh, as in the ownership spot and derivative assets has to be the same as well as the timing has to be the same. And so, uh, you know, perfect hedges are not really all that realistic. Um, but the total return swaps, what that allows you to do is come up with what you would think of as a perfect hedge. I mean, I don't really want to use that terminology, but that customization really allows you um, to be able to better match the risk and return objectives. Yeah, daily margin monitoring, we talked about that. Potential for interest rate and counterparty risk. So, of course, that's a, a concern. So, let's see, we're going to operate at a leverage of five. 20% is provided in cash, 80% borrowing. We've got uh, 3% of this three month rate for futures and swaps. There's an extra 0.7% financing cost for ETF. So this is what we're gonna do here. Uh, we're gonna drift in our asset allocation. So there's our strategic allocation in that first column. There's our window. So we do the corridor plus or minus, and then here's the minimum and max based on that corridor. And so notice we have in that current allocation on the far right column, uh, we put some of those in, uh, in orange. And so those orange are indicators that are either outside of the min or max or very, very close to it. You know, so the question then becomes, is this what we want to do if they're outside of that min max, then we probably do if they're, if they're uh, somewhere near, then, you know, what's the question? You know, look at fixed income. So the minimum is 9%. So the current allocation gets us to 9.5%. So we have to keep an eye on it, right? Monitoring monthly, maybe worry about it. But then we can maybe go ahead and throw in a treasury bond futures contract if that thing gets down to 9.25 or 9.10. Of course, we don't have enough information here in this, you know, relatively brief case. And the Institute, if they wanted you to do that, they'd have to tell you, they'd have to tell you that inside of the question stem. So here's just a quick summary of what uh, I just described with those orange comments, uh, the orange uh, numbers over on that far right column. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to decrease the international developed equity and increase the fixed income allocation by 1.5% as an immediate measure. This will bring the former back to the upper limit of its corridor. So we're also delivering, deliberating whether to execute the transaction through the cash market or the derivatives market. So cash could take more time. Uh, one and a half percent rebalancing transaction over a three month. Yeah, so these other costs bid, bid and ask, cash drag of 23 points, uh, same rebalancing transaction would occur 28 basis points and then bid ask of four basis points. So you have all of that stuff in there in addition to um, in addition to some other factors that we haven't really considered. You know, so what does uh, Robinson decide to do? Yeah, equity back to 10%. 3.5% decrease in equity, 3.5% increase in fixed income. Um, 
one year uh, will incur 70 basis points in transaction costs. Yeah, okay. So in the futures market, there will be 95% basis uh, 95 basis points of transaction cost so I would be able to here let me just go back here I would be able to go ahead and take you know this table here together with some extra information about the basis points here and then you know make some concluding recommendations Here's a good summary page tactical asset allocation what do we do we had these derivative overlays uh, what were the benefits, flexibility, speed, savings cost, and uh, rebalancing there? So that makes, makes perfect sense of all the stuff that we've talked about over the last uh, over the last 30 minutes or so. So what do we need to consider? We need to consider those transaction costs. We need to consider uh, tracking error and deviation. So always think about tra 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 tracking error, you know, as that standard deviation, and then the speed and the time horizon. All right, let's go ahead and finish up with some ESG considerations, which we haven't discussed at all inside of this case. So let's go ahead and try to figure out exactly what this means. So we have environmental issues, we have social issues, we have governance issues. Um, how does this play a role in liquidity management, asset allocation, and the derivatives? And so once again, the Institute is very big on that very first block point. Uh, so we need to Acknowledge that these ESG factors, they impact risk and return of investments. So what we need to do is we need to link these ESG factors with the risk and return objective um, of the client. Now, what the Institute wants us to do is to focus on explicit and systematic inclusion of ESG factors. We did all that stuff in, uh, in previous learning modules. All right, so we did a manager of selection. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at those two, right? We didn't do this at all back in, what was that, about 20 minutes ago when we selected uh, those two managers, uh, when we selected one from those two managers. So we need to consider what are the ESG integration policies of each of those two, which means that we need to get a report from them. You know, tell us what you're doing. Tell us what your consideration, proxy voting, uh, pollution, carpet footprint, all those kinds of things. And of course, they could be summarized by the multitude of those ESG uh, indexes or scores that are out there. Yeah, principles uh, for responsible investment. That makes sense. We talked about this. Uh, we talked about this before. Raising ESG issues with external managers during periodic review meetings. We need to say something like, hey, look, this is important to us. How important is it to you? We want transparency. We want you to go to, uh, here, I say this to you regularly. Do you remember? Go to your Bloomberg terminal, type in a company, and you'll get uh, all of the companies on this side of the supply chain, all of the companies on so this side of the supply chain, in that supply chain function. So we need uh, we need all that transparency. Uh, proxy voting, I think this is super important. I, I I believe this is important, mostly because I spent lots of my dissertation, you know, gosh, this is 30 years ago by now, looking at uh, looking at proxy statements and voting. And of course, back then there was, you know, this is I wrote my dissertation in 1992 and 1993. So back then this was not uh, not important. The the environment wasn't too terribly important, but the government's was hugely important. You know, these proxy voting, are we going to, how are we going to vote this? And of course, now, nowadays we need to vote with both, you know, not just, uh, not just the G, the governance pr principles, but we need to do the E and the G as well. And then the Institute uh, regularly says something like, look, if we have these parameters under which we want to make certain that we're adhering to under our asset allocation and security selection, uh, we want to have divestment as a last resort. Continuous monitoring, we do that all the time, and editing. Hey, this was a long uh, case study. Uh, so I hope it was worth it. What did I say earlier? So we've been through our example. I want you to go through the example inside of the learning module. That's probably a 30 minute commitment. And then go to the super really good questions at the end of this learning module. I think there are 12 of them. We've covered most of those inside of this recording. So hey, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great day and good luck studying.